coffee shops. Coffee, providing a clue for the extinction of all humans? Really. A rabbit hole, obviously. Apparently, author John Bandler thinks so too because he calls his play the caffeine rabbit hole. Me, Jacqueline Scobie, he calls Lenick. L-E-N-I-K, Lenick. A let's get this job done and report back as soon as possible extraterrestrial. What's going on, listeners? Thanks for tuning back to the Alomac here on 93.3 CFMU. We have a special episode today where we'll be speaking to three McMaster PhD students and a professor on their months-long artistic collaboration that has resulted in the production of a short film, The Caffeine Rabbit Hole. You'll shortly learn what The Caffeine Rabbit Hole is all about, but first we need to know about the Hamilton Fringe Festival, where The Caffeine Rabbit Hole has been submitted as a video entry. The Hamilton Fringe Festival is a 12-day event taking place from July 15th to the 25th this year, where musicals, dances, comedies, magic shows, and all sorts of family entertainment is either being streamed or presented live at a distance. It started back in 2003, and today it attracts over 20,000 people annually, and shows are presented across 10 venues in Hamilton, Ontario. The Hamilton Fringe Fence Festival is a platform for the expression of all sorts of talent and creativity. So speaking of talent and creativity, now is time to talk to the team behind the caffeine rabbit hole. So today with us, we have Rachel Ho, Megan Vierhout, Emily Wood, who are McMaster PhD students, and John Bandler, who is a McMaster professor and, of course, the go-to expert for all things three-minute thesis related. <laughs> So I wanted to first um, chat a little bit. If you can uh, perhaps describe and introduce yourselves maybe as uh, the roles you take on as graduate researchers, but then of course the roles you took on for the production of the caffeine rabbit hole. Rachel, if we can start with you. Sure, I'm Rachel. I'm a PhD student in psychology, neuroscience and behavior. And I do uh, brain imaging in children with concussion just to figure out what happens to your brain after you get a concussion when you're a child. And I was involved in the project first as a reader and I was just reading John's scripts. And then John and I sort of brainstormed a, a little logo for his series of plays. And that has become the logo that we, we've we used for the caffeine rabbit hole. That's on our mugs that John's holding up if you're watching this. Yeah, so for, for oh yeah, my, uh, my virtual screen sometimes goes out on me, but for viewers that are watching this on YouTube, um, Tell us a little bit more about this uh, mug, Rachel, why don't you? And maybe how the design came about. I'll take a so sip. The design is, for anybody that's not watching, it's a light brown coffee mug that says coffee shop on it. And the smoke coming or the steam coming from the cup reveals two heads facing one another. And inside each head is a little brain of the other person the person that they're looking at. It's mm. hard to describe, but there's a little brain inside everybody's brain. And that was sort of um, a brainstorm that John and I had put together because when you have one-on-one -on -one conversations, you're often thinking about what the other person knows and trying to communicate to that person to the best that you're able to. And uh, we have something called mirror neurons in us. And mirror neurons are sort of these neurons that mimic another person's state of being. And um, when I was reading John's plays and as we had chatted about the series of plays that he has written, only one of them is in production now, but the series that he has written, we sort of put together this idea of thinking about other people and how to communicate with an another person. And uh, science communication is part of all of that. So that's how I was very interested in it. Excellent. It sounds like a great little teaser on uh, what the caffeine rabbit hole is all about, which we'll also uh, get into a little bit later on. Um, Megan, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and also the role you took on? Yeah, of course. So hi, I'm Megan. Um, I'm a PhD student in the medical sciences program. Um, and I research a lung disease called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I know that might be a mouthful, um, but essentially it's a disease where the lungs become scarred. 
um, and it makes breathing very difficult. Um, I met John through the McMaster three minute thesis competition as well um, when I was competing in 2019. And then um, we worked together in 2020. Unfortunately, the competition was canceled due to the pandemic. Um, but from there, John and I continued conversation about science communication and public speaking. Um, and I came onto the project initially as a reader as well, same as Rachel. Um, John would share scripts with me. Um, I would attend the script readings over Zoom um, and give feedback and give my thoughts on those. Um, and then a few months after that, um, John invited me to be the assistant to the director for the Caffeine Rabbit Hole. Um, what that entails, I guess, is a little bit of everything. Um, I don't have a specific one role per se. Um, John has many great ideas and uh, he's always sharing them with me. And uh, we kind of, I guess, bounce off each other. Um, I help with a little bit of uh, advertising. We're currently um, doing that right now over social media. Um, helping with some ideas for video editing of the play itself. Um, I attended the rehearsals and kind of was um, the script, script manager during the rehearsals. Uh, and yeah, just a little bit of everything. <laughs> yeah, it sounds very, like a very multifaceted role. So congrats on that. Um, and Emily, you. if you can speak a little bit, both as your role as a graduate researcher and the role you took on for this project. Sure. So I'm a PhD student in um, PNB, so in psychology, uh, just finishing my first year of my PhD. And um, as a scientist, I'm just completely fascinated with musical behavior. So why do we have music uh, as human beings? Um, it's an ancient behavior that goes back at least 35,000 years into our evolutionary history. You can we find music across all cultures across the world. Um, so I think this is a, something that's really interesting and a question that's kind of tapping into our humanity in a way. So, um, so yeah, as a scientist, I'm really interested in why we have these behaviors. And one of the projects I work on for my PhD is actually how uh, musicians are able to play together. Um, so, so playing music is an incredibly complex task. And even just playing music by yourself is an amazing feat. But how do we play with other people. So this, this is one of the questions I'm trying to answer uh, for my PhD. And then uh, as for the caffeine rabbit hole, so uh, this is a really interesting question. So I actually met uh, John earlier this year in about February. I met him while I was working on my Gradflix video uh, describing my research. So of course, this is kind of related to science communication. So, so that's how I met John. And as I got to know him, he told me about this play he was working on, The Caffeine Rabbit Hole, and he invited me to a rehearsal. So I thought, you know, why not? This sounds kind of interesting. I'll check it out. And so I attended one of the rehearsals and he sent me um, the script. And as I read this script, I have to say the thing that really drew me towards it was this idea that we kind of see on the mug here, this idea of trying to understand what another person is thinking and feeling, this, this theory of mind, if you will. Um, I was just completely drawn to that theme and um, that's, that's probably what draw me towards it. Excellent, and thank you for sharing that, Emily. Uh, and John, so as the uh, writer, the producer, the, the director of The Caffeine Rabbit Hole, can you tell us a little bit more um, I guess about these roles, and if you can also introduce what the caffeine rabbit hole is all about. Well, just to follow on what Emily uh, just said about the theory of mind, it's interesting, I hadn't heard that expression for a little while, but uh, research that I've been doing for the last quarter century called space mapping, uh, uh, an approach to engineering design has been described in terms of analogies as a theory of mind concept. So there is a kind of a full circle here in a sense, uh, something as something related to cognition, something related to people communicating with each other. And of course, Emily's work about about musicians playing together. Um, so there's a there's a, a certain connection between all of these aspects of the um, of the uh, of, of, of the uh, situation. Um, 
in terms of the caffeine rabbit hole, wow! I, I wrote eight. Uh, I wrote eight plays last year, and I'm in the middle of two or three others, short plays, uh, on on um, uh, on the theme of coffee shop. So the idea that they all take place in a coffee shop, they all involve two people. Um, and uh, anyway, this particular one, the caffeine rabbit hole, w turned out to be the most popular one. Um, in all the readings that we had, it seemed to, it seemed to strike a, a chord with the people that were on the uh, in the audience of the uh, of the reading, and so uh, it became sort of my flagship uh, story um, in terms of doing something at the Hamilton Fringe Festival. Now, the Fringe Festival is not a juried festival; uh, it's entry and and acceptance to enter is by lottery. So we were lucky that we were able to get in and I opted right away for what they call the digital exclusives um, section. Digital exclusive simply means you have to submit a video. So little did I know last year that my play, which I thought would be a video, turned into a fully fledged edited film with a music soundtrack that Emily can talk about maybe a little bit later. Um, so, uh, so anyway, what is the caffeine rabbit hole all about? It's about two extraterrestrials um, who uh, um, uh, explore the idea that coffee shops provide a clue to the extinction of humans. That, that, that's it. I know it, you, you, you look surprised there, the extinction of humans. That's all of us. We're all gone. We don't exist anymore. And uh, some extraterrestrials maybe have stumbled upon us and are trying to figure out what went wrong with this uh, civilization. And uh, they, in, they, they look into the possibility that the concept of coffee shop provides a clue. So there's, this is a simulation, if you like, of extraterrestrials trying to place themselves in a coffee shop environment to see what could possibly be happening in a coffee shop that could result in the extinction of humans. So that's it in a long, in a big nutshell. Oh, that's wonderful, John. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I was also reading the uh, plot description on your website and it mentioned how these extraterrestrials, they take on these humanoid forms um, and like you mentioned, how they're trying to see how coffee shops can offer some sort of clues as to where the humans have gone. Um, so I think the, the two, as you mentioned, it's, uh, you write plays with typically two individuals in the settings of coffee shops. And those two individuals, I don't think they're here with us uh, today, but do you want to speak briefly about their roles or the characters that they may play? You mean the, the, the actresses involved? That's right, Lenik and Dara, I believe. Yeah, Lennox and Dara. Yes, the two the two characters in the show. Well, uh, you know, the actress that plays uh, Dara, Steph uh, Christians, is a very well known local uh, actress. She's been involved for a long, long time in local theater. Um, you know, and uh, as I say, is very well known. I've known her for a number of years. Um, Jacqueline Scobie, who plays Lennox. Uh, I've known also for a long time. She's a graduate from McMaster University, film and theater quite a while ago. And she's also well known as a director of, of, of plays as well as, a, as well as acting. And uh, as I say, um, my initial contact was with Steph who suggested Jacqueline and, uh, and, and we've worked incredibly well. In fact, we first got involved in the readings I think sometime in October, November of last year, um, and sort of stayed in touch ever since. And it's just worked very well. The team has worked really well. And we were talking about these uh, coffee mugs earlier, and I was watching the trailer for the film as well. And this coffee mug made an appearance more than once, I'll say. So um, I guess what kind of, uh, like, how does the coffee mug and its, its uh, 
uh, logo and um, what it means. How does that tie into the show here? And either oh, you or Rachel can. That, that, is a, that is a closely guarded secret. All righty then. I, I thought actually, I could get something out of you. Interestingly, interesting that you should ask that because that is actually a very good question. Only Megan and I know the secret to that right now. And in fact, it, it's interesting that, you know, the, 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 the idea of this didn't and, 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 and the role it really plays in the film uh, is something that didn't really strike me until perhaps, what is it, a couple of weeks ago, Megan, I think, right? Yeah. So, so we try, don't, don't reveal it. It's a secret. Uh, we might have a competition and get people to guess what the significance really is. So uh, it, it's interesting. It's, it's all over the place. I mean, it is literally, you know, the film is littered, if you like, with, with that mug. And, uh, you know, so there are the, there's the significance that Rachel attached to it, namely the, the two heads with brains in, in each, the opposite brain in each other's heads. Um, the idea that when we have a conversation with each other, for example, a conversation with you, I have a model of your brain inside mine, and that allows me to respond very quickly because having that model inside my own brain, I can, I, can under, I can understand or I think I understand rather quickly what question you are addressing that allows me to respond quickly. And that's the idea of these mirror neurons and so on. But anyway, that's a little bit of a digression. What's the significance of this? You'll have to watch the film and then try to figure it out. All right. So you got and, and you know, as I say, the thing that has surprised me, and I think may have surprised uh, and will surprise Emily and Rachel even now going forward, is that this particular play, when I when I wrote it. You know, I had, I had a certain concept in my mind. I, it was sort of tongue-in-cheek, and I was having a little bit of fun and throwing in a few things relating to what how humans behave and their emotions and things like this. And this has just evolved over a period of time into something that is, in a way, almost unrecognizable to me in terms of what it started off. And, you know, the end of this journey uh, with the finished product that we have right now is what Emily has added to it with her music. So that's another dimension that's been added that, honestly, it's brought out aspects of the story that uh, Rachel will and, and Megan will testify to this that hadn't occurred to me months ago. So there's so much in this. There are so many layers that, that it's it's been incredibly interpreted by Steph, by Jacqueline, and by Emily as well. So Emily, if I can jump to you then, um, you mentioned that your PhD thesis works on it, but I'm really interested to find out how you uh, composed the music for this film and kind of what was going through your mind when you were designing that. Yeah, that's a great question. So I've never done music for a film before. I've certainly composed quite a bit in my life. I actually have a music degree. I did a Bachelor of Music in Jazz Piano performance at McGill, and I was constantly composing uh, during my four years there, uh, but never for a film. And the process was completely new to me, but I really enjoyed it. So I spent a long time studying the script and I read through it over and over again, and I thought, what does what does this really mean? And you know, John mentioned that you know he thought of it as kind of tongue in cheek at some points, but uh, to me, when I read it, there was parts that I thought were really profound, and it, it it kind of sparked something in my creativity, I guess. So so first, I went through the script and I kind of came up with an interpretation, my own interpretation of the script. And then when I went to the music, I have to say um, uh, the way I approach composition is through improvisation. Um, that might be part of my training. Like I have a jazz degree. I'm trained in improvisation. But to me, improvising is just raw ideas. So, so after I studied the script and I came up with this kind of idea of how, uh, you know, what's going on in this, in this film, I just simply improvised along to the film. And, you know, I listened back to what I had improvised and I thought, okay, you know, this is good. This, this captures it, but, you know, 
this could use some work here. So it's kind of, it, for me, it was kind of like a continual process of me editing my improvisations and editing. And, and if I didn't like it, I would go back and redo it until I came up with this kind of um, roadmap of music for the film. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of, uh, a large degree of reflexivity that was involved and a lot of back and forth between yourself. Um, Definitely. Yeah, so how long did that process take? I guess, like you mentioned, you read the script over and over and these uh, iterations that you made, if you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, that's a great question. I actually, that, I should go back and try to figure out how many iterations <laughs> it took. It was many iterations. Um, yeah, it, it, this is a really interesting because, you know, I am a, a science student. I'm in the faculty of science right now. And, you know, I have this analytical brain, but at the same time, I'm an artist and I'm a musician. And I have this completely non-analytical creative brain. And I just find this really fascinating because, you know, when I'm doing science, I have to control my brain. And when I'm doing music, I have to succumb to my brain. And that's exactly what I did when I, I did this music. I had to just completely turn off any analytical thought I had. And I, I just trust that my brain knew what it wanted to do. And I'm just let it, let it come out, I suppose. Okay. So um, uh, Emily, can you tell us a little bit more? I know you talked a bit about the composition of the music and the process of that, but can you tell us first where this was recorded and I guess the, the more detailed description of the process and maybe the iterations and the roadblocks you may have faced? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So um, I actually wrote all the music um, uh, on my friend's piano, actually. So I was house sitting for my friend and I, it was the first time I was playing a real piano in over a year, I think, cause you know, COVID, I don't have a real piano at home. So I've just been playing at my, my keyboard here. So, you know, it, playing on a real piano, like it's hard to describe with words, but um, it sparks something different in me than an electric piano does. It's more responsive than an electric piano ever will be. There's something more emotional about playing a real acoustic instrument. And that kind of helped, helped me actually come up with this music. Um, so after I wrote it, I realized, you know, this is music that's not meant to be played on a keyboard. This is meant to be played on an acoustic, a, a real piano. You know, I was thinking to myself, you know, where where could I record this? And like, well, you know what? I work in the live lab at McMaster. And for the listeners who don't know about the live lab at McMaster, this is a performance theater on the McMaster campus. That's actually a theater and a research lab in one. So we can have uh, you know, up to 100 audience members in there, and we can um, actually measure their brain responses to music with EEG while they attend a real concert. So, you know, we have physiological um, equipment, um, uh, lots of great uh, research equipment in there for studies of music. So anyway, so that's where I do my research. So um, I research how music musicians play together in the live lab. Um, I use the motion capture system in there actually for that. Um, but they actually have a beautiful grand piano a disc clavier a yamaha disc clavier in there so so i was actually able to record the music for this play on on that piano nice it must have also been nice to get back on campus as a student oh it felt so great you know i just can't wait to get back yeah. to campus and get back to back to the regular research putting on a backpack just to feel something i'm with you <laughs> yeah and emily um to me it seems like you're kind of speaking to how uh your work for this project kind of um, uh, related back or affected your graduate research and vice versa, how you're comparing and contrasting the two. So Megan or Rachel, I'm also curious, did you find that your work and your efforts in this project um, impacted the way that you looked at your own science? Definitely, definitely. And around the theme of science communication, um, which um, I have been learning from John now for quite a few years, um, I feel like it, it's so applicable. Um, if you're, you, you've probably heard of the three minute elevator pitch. Um, if you're in an elevator with someone or you're in passing with someone and you want to describe what you do, you need to convey it in a way that also is accurately interpreted by them. And that even goes back to um, like the, the coffee shop logo, right? I'm transmitting information from my brain into yours. And how do I communicate that effectively? So um, you understand it and it's accurate. And I, 
I, I hope that you're perceiving it um, the way that I'm communicating it. And being involved in this process and kind of activating my right brain when I'm a very left-brained individual who's been um, working in basic science for some time now um, was really refreshing. And I would often tell John, you know, like I, I'm deep in science all day, but then I get these breaks where um, like during the rehearsals and during talking about creative ideas that I get to break free from that and um, delve into something else. So like Emily was saying, um, it's two different mindsets almost, but they do come together. Um, and yeah, they definitely affect each other. So especially from a communication aspect, I feel that being involved um, in something like this uh, has, has really affected me. And speaking to uh, science communication, I had the same feeling about thinking about all the ways in which I have to convey science through an image now. And when John and I were sort of brainstorming this idea of this logo, I was really questioning what I was doing because at some points I was thinking, well, we don't have a physical copy of somebody else's brain in our own brains. We have a representation of it. And I was thinking, well, if I tell the public that there's another person's brain in their brain, am I miscommunicating science? And so it gave me this sort of <laughs> dilemma about how I communicate things well. And um, we came to the idea of just using color to represent sort of somebody else depiction or your depiction of somebody else's brain in your brain. And it, it made me actually go back to the literature a little bit as I was talking to John and we were brainstorming this idea because these representations we have in our brains of somebody else's mind is sort of distributed in these networks across your brain. So it's not just one particular part of your brain that's responding to somebody else. It's distributed and your brain works in concert all over the place. And when you have a disorder or a disease, or you have something like a concussion that disrupts those processes. And so it can actually disrupt your ability to understand somebody else or to communicate your own feelings to somebody else. And as we're uh, going through the caffeine rabbit holes, you'll eventually see if you go watch the play. Um, it's just a really hyperbolic ex like view of what miscommunication or inability to understand somebody else looks like in the depiction of extraterrestrials and how they understand humans. It's very, it's really fun. And it was really fun to see this um, very artistic way of theory of mind um, or disorders and diseases can be played out through these extraterrestrial characters. That's fascinating. Just to bring it full circle to my PhD research, this is also completely relevant to what I'm studying right now. So right now I'm studying how musicians play together. Um, and if you think about it, this is a completely nonverbal task, right? You play together without speaking. And, you know, there's so much variability in music, like, you know, the music speeds up, it slows down, it gets higher intensity and lower intensity and I have my own internal model in me of exactly how this music should go and my partner maybe I'm in a string quartet maybe I'm the violin player the cello player also has their own internal model of how these crescendos and decrescendos and how this music should be expressed so how do we bring our internal models into alignment and come up with this cohesive performance so so this is not a trivial theme I think that this this idea of theory of mind uh, relates to so many facets. facets. Um, it's very interesting. And the potential and impact of what miscommunication can do. Exactly. What happens when a mistake happens and how, how do you recover from that? Oh, these are all such wonderful teasers of the play. I'm uh, really looking forward uh, to watching the film uh, once it uh, streams. Uh, so, John, going back to you, uh, have you sent this uh film or parts of the film to anyone, um, any, uh, I guess, feedback or critiques so far? Uh, yes, actually, um, I shared it with a good friend of mine, uh, Tom Macken, who's a well-known local theater director. I've worked with him in the past. He's directed some of my plays. I've sat in on some big productions of his, so we know each other very well. Um, he had a preview of the film on his own, and then a few days later, he wanted me to come with him, to sit with him, to watch the film together, mm -hmm. so that uh, he we can stop the film and he can critique it with me right there on the spot. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and and he's been he he he's been uh, in the theater for decades. I mean, he's just steeped in this stuff. 
And so um, he did have some comments, and I'm not even going to tell you what those comments are until it's all over. But he, w the comments that he did have were ones that I said to myself, if those are the comments that really attract his attention, it means we've solved an awful lot of other problems. So if I can put it that way, it just gave me real uh, encouragement. And the other thing is while he was watching the film, I was looking at him and I could see, so there you are, two brains, right? I can practically read his mind and he can read mine pretty much. And um, I could see just from the smile on his face and how he was responding to Jacqueline and Steph on screen. He was just, even though he'd seen it before, he was just literally mesmerized. And so I, I think he likes the film. And, uh, and then Gary Smith, uh, I, I let Gary Smith, the well-known uh, uh, dance and theater crit critic of the Hamilton Spectator, again, a very well-known uh, uh, personality in the Hamilton area. I gave him a private link and uh, showing of the film. And he, he wrote a glowing uh, email in response and gave me permission to use any parts of it in my promotion. So he was just thrilled. He knows both of the actresses. He's seen some of my fringe plays before. So he's already critiqued my work previously. And I, all I can say, he was thrilled. Um, and Megan and Rachel and Emily have had copies of this. And uh, I, I think uh, you'll, you'll agree that was pretty good. So, yes. we're, 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 I mean, it's re we're, we're really enthusiastic about this. I, I have to say, I saw an... I saw a version that I thought was the final and I was, I was messaging John how much I loved it, especially seeing it in high definition. Cause I, I mm. saw them in zoom meetings and without great recording opportunities and whatnot. And then tying in Emily's music. I was just, I was just floored by how much I loved it only to get a text from John a few days later being like, we tweaked something. And I thought, <laughs> what is left to tweak? But John's such a, a perfectionist and, and he works with people who are much like yeah. him. So <laughs> I haven't even seen that elevated uh, final, final, final pro product quite yet. So that, that was not me. That, that's Emily. That was uh, Emily. Was <laughs> I, I just had a, it was just a couple yeah. of tweaks. You probably won't even notice them, to be honest. <laughs> No, but I'm sure with Emily, they probably jump right out at her, right? Yeah, I, I am very sensitive to um, sound, I suppose. So, so it was just little things in sound, um, I suppose. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that I, I don't know how you all, all of you feel, but um, when I'm watching, whether it's an advertisement on TV or a documentary or film, sometimes they have this music track that drowns out the... Uh, the, the dialogue and it, 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 it seems unrelated. It's sort of like a separate, it, it, it's like, it's as if whoever supplied that music had no idea what was going on in that film or documentary. And one of the things I like about what I think we've kind of achieved here is I think we've, we've harmonized the two. And what was interesting to me uh, is that um, Gary Smith did not point out made no comment on the music, which to me is one way of saying it was transparent to him. Mm. Something that's transparent, but he was clearly affected by the mood that it provided. And, and similarly, Tom. Tom did have, did have some comments on the music, but again, I won't share that with Emily until this is, <laughs> this is over. It was complimentary. So Tom, but Tom is not only a bit of a classical music uh, fanatic, he's also a bit of a linguist. He was very, very picky about the way certain things were pronounced. And he pointed them out to me. And why did she pronounce it this way rather than this way? And I thought, oh, you know, Tom, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It's, it's how it's actually pronounced says an awful lot about the understanding you have of that concept. And if it's something that's brand new to you, how would you pronounce a new word that you just heard? And these extraterrestrials are going through language English language in this particular case, for the first time. So you have to sort of suspend your disbelief in that somehow they're conversing in English in humanoid form. Um, but then he was picking out little bits of pronunciation 
and we were having a discussion on it. So that was the fine detail we were going into. That's so interesting how you had individuals from different fields give their perspective on the film and how they're pointing out whether it's linguistic elements, whether they're um, the, the theater and dance critic and the aspects that they're uh, highlighting. And yeah. I think that's also reflected on the interdisciplinary nature of the team members for this film, how people are coming from different backgrounds and the different strengths that they brought. I think that uh, likely really comes out in the film. So I'm excited to see that. Yeah, and it, it was, you know, quite fortuitous in, in, you know, in some ways. I know there's a connection with Three Minute Thesis and with Grad Flicks and so on. And Emily, not Emily, I mean, Megan was also in the Grad Flicks competition this year as well. So it was both Emily and, and, and Megan. Um, uh, but how, how, you know, how this team kind of came together and evolved completely in a way with diverse interests and skills and, and know-how, and somehow we were able to synthesize something. I, I, you know, I, the one thing that I regret or looking ahead of is that I don't know if I'll ever be able to put another team like this together again. (laughs) I'll try, but you know, you, you, it's it's a team to die for, to be honest with you. And, and uh, so that's my bottom line. And I'm curious, once audience members watch this film, is there anything that you want them to leave with, or is there anything that you think they'll have questions about once they watch this film? Well, will they ever drink coffee again? <laughs> Okay. And, um, but no, I'm, that, I'm being a little bit facetious here. Well, you know, it, it, I mean, uh, the idea of how extraterrestrials might, if they exist and if they ever find us, uh, would look at what human beings are, you know, their, their entangled emotions and inability to control all kinds of aspects of their lives their inability to really understand what's going on inside the mind of another human, uh, you know, these ideas could be completely foreign to an extraterrestrial. So the idea, for example, that we can only, we only have a sort of a partial view of each other. We don't really understand each other perfectly. And, And there's another theme that constantly runs through my mind, and I didn't explore this necessarily, although it may be there, and that is the idea of competition. Would extraterrestrials be involved in competitive, everything is competitive, and every form of life on Earth is in competition. You know, plants try to try to uh, uh, take up as much space as they can in terms of area. They want as much of the sun as they can get. They want as much of the water as they can get. So plants are obviously very territorial. Animals are territorial. And even and human beings are obviously competing with each other, even when we're cooperating, even in a, even in a research team in a, in a lab, a, a group of students, even faculty members. They're always in com- competition with each other for promotion, for salary, for recognition, for authorship of a paper. So there's this constant competition. And I just wonder if the, if extraterrestrials exist, whether this is what would drive them. Mm. So that's, that's another right. dimension to this particular story. And yeah, go ahead, Megan, Rachel, or Emily, if you have any um, thoughts on what you think the audience members may be thinking themselves as they're watching or um, once they've digested it a little bit, what do you hope they kind of leave with? Um, when I first read the script and when I first saw the reading, what really was brought to my attention was kind of similar to what John explained, um, extraterrestrials in humanoid form, things that are so commonplace to humans that they're analyzing and learning about um, that we we don't even think twice about because we are human. Um, so it kind of gives you a new perspective in that way, like an outsider's view. Um, and I also wanted to add a quick comment, um, piggybacking on John's competition comment. Um, ironically, this team right here wouldn't have been put together if it wasn't for a competition itself being mm-hmm. either three minute thesis or grad flicks, which 
are advertised as competitions to communicate and share your research. Wonderful. So from that competition came this uh, extraordinary collaboration. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, that's interesting. I'll just say before Rachel or Emily make a comment, uh, one of my, one of my uh, best collaborators ever, um, a, 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 a mathematician in Denmark called Kai Matson, uh, we came together after I rejected several of his papers in a, in a, in a journal in, in, in the 70s. And uh, we became good friends after I rejected his papers. Oh, and we, John. And we collaborated <laughs> ever since. I never knew you were reviewer number two, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, enough from me for a moment. Uh, Rachel or Emily, did you have um, any comments on what you think the audience might be left with or what you hope they're left with? Yeah, that's a great question. I think Megan summed it up pretty well. I, I really hope they leave thinking about what it means to be human, what what makes us human, what is really unique about humans. These are all themes I thought about a lot when working on this. Yeah, and we don't want to give you the we don't want to give you the actual the list right now. You have to come and watch the film to see what what list of things we go through and what what conclusions we come up with. I've had some time to think about it because uh, when I first saw John's first plays, even before this one was written, it was sort of at the beginning of quarantine, some sometime last year. I, I have no consensus of time anymore, but it was much early on. And John and I had a conversation after he wrote that play, the very first play, not the caffeine rabbit hole, but a much a different play about how communication through Zoom is so different and how conversations that you would have in person don't often happen on zoom and um in-person communication just brings on different topics that you may not have with the barrier of going through the internet and having watching ourselves through video and not even being able to make eye contact with somebody and so um when you think about these extraterrestrials it, it also makes me think about barriers that we sort of were sprung up sprung upon us because we had to suddenly go into isolation and our modes of communication changed so much and it felt very felt very alienating and felt very strange almost like we were all a little bit like aliens uh, at the beginning of quarantine yeah and rachel you really recall that first play was called the thinking contest remember? yeah yeah it's which is actually was the it was the um, sort of the inspiration for the logo um, because all your plays are sort of have this theme of um, communicating with somebody else. And so uh, the logo that we're using for the play actually is a logo to encompass all of John's little plays that he wrote in the coffee shop series. Wow, it's so interesting. An all-encompassing logo. Way to go, Rachel. <laughs> I had John's help. I had John's help. It's not all me. <laughs> okay, I think you folks has, have teased us enough with regards to the plot of the caffeine rabbit hole, what the logo means, and I'm looking forward to figuring that all out. So for listeners that are interested, where can they purchase tickets? How much may they do they cost? And what dates um, is this film being streamed on? Yeah, well, it's being streamed through the Fringe uh, Festival website. Uh, that's uh, HamiltonFringe.ca is is where they go for that, and they can see an array of uh, an array of other programs that are that are being delivered. Um, you have to buy what they call a backer button. It costs five dollars to buy a backer button, and you must. You must open an account when you go onto their website, buy a backer button, and then go to the individual shows, films, events uh, that you want to purchase. And uh, it's really pay as pay whatever you can afford. Uh, so that's that's the that's the idea. Um, if you want to go directly to the caffeine rabbit hole, and the, uh, the the URL is tiny URL tiny URL slash caffeine rabbit i think you can remember that so tiny url slash caffeine rabbit that takes you straight to the uh, entry uh, our films entry in the hamilton film festival wonderful and in case you didn't catch that or you have trouble spelling caffeine like i do i will put that all in the show notes um, for everyone to easily access mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to it um, once it streams and purchasing tickets thanks so much Sawyer. i really appreciate it
Oh, well, thank you to you, John, Megan, Rachel, and Emily for coming on the show today and talking about this really exciting project. Thanks, you. Thanks thank for having you. us. Of course. And thank you to all our listeners here on 93.3 CFMU. Stay tuned because Get Lit is coming up next. Bye, everyone.